Assalamu alaikum and hi everyone. Today we're going to look at our 10th lecture, Sampling for Qualitative Research. In the last video lecture, you were introduced to probability sampling, which is commonly used in quantitative research. In this video, we will look at non-probability sampling that is vital in qualitative research. Non-probabilistic sampling represents a group of sampling techniques that help researchers to select units from a population that they are interested in studying. However, a core characteristic of non-probability sampling techniques is that samples are selected based on the subjective judgment of the researcher. It is based on specific criteria that have nothing to do with probability. But does that mean non-probability samples are not representative of the population? Well, not necessarily, but it does mean that non-probability samples cannot depend on the rationale of probability theory. We cannot know the probability that we have represented the population well. With non-probabilistic samples, we may or may not represent the population well, and it will often be hard for us to know how well we've done so. In applied social science research, there may be circumstances where it is not feasible, practical, or theoretically sensible to do random sampling, and poor response from a probabilistically selected sample is not much good either. Hence, researchers have also resorted to non-probability methods. Some of the advantages include it is less costly and effort-intensive if time is of the essence and the budget is limited. Hence, it can lay claim to be cost-effective. It may be the only option when the sampling frame is not available and the population is unknown. It is also useful for exploratory research, for instance, in generating hypotheses. It helps to indicate a range of responses and is therefore a method that is considerably flexible. So what are the reasons for researchers to adopt non-probabilistic sampling? There are generally two reasons, under theoretical and practical purposes. Theoretically, non-probability sampling techniques can provide researchers with strong theoretical reasons for their choice of units or cases to be included in their sample. Non-probability sampling requires researchers to use their subjective judgments, drawing on theory, that is, the academic literature, and practice, that is, the experience of the researcher and the evolutionary nature of the research process. The goal is not to achieve objectivity in the selection of samples, or necessarily attempt to make generalizations, but to understand the intricacies of the sample being studied. The units themselves, not the wider world, are the primary foci of interest. Under practical purposes, non-probability sampling is often used because the procedures used to select units for inclusion in a sample are much easier, quicker and cheaper when compared with probability sampling. For students doing dissertations at the undergraduate and master's level, such practicalities often lead to the use of non-probability sampling techniques. Sometimes, non-probability sampling may be the only viable alternative that can be used. This would be the case with those populations that are hidden or hard to reach, where a list of the population simply does not exist. Non-probability sampling can also be particularly useful in exploratory research, where the aim is to find out if a problem or issue even exists in a quick and inexpensive way. Then the objective is to find units with problems to be researched. Despite their numerous advantages and strengths, probability sampling techniques are not always possible or feasible, and poor response from a probabilistically selected sample also compromises its external validity. Hence, researchers have also resorted to using non-probability sampling methods. We can divide non-probabilistic sampling techniques into two broad types, purposive or self-selecting. Most non-probability sampling methods are purposive in nature because we usually approach the sampling problem with a specific purpose in mind. Examples would be quota sampling, expert sampling, or snowball sampling. On the other hand, a sample is self-selected when the inclusion or exclusion of sampling units is determined by whether the units themselves agree or decline to participate in the sample, either explicitly or implicitly. An example would be convenience sampling. 
Quota sampling is a sampling method where a sample of respondents with specific characteristics and traits is selected from the population of interest. It is commonly used in market research. A pre-selected criterion is used to classify the population into groups, for instance, age. The next step is to find out the proportion of elements in the population that falls within each age group. We then select the total number of elements to be studied. Quotas of the elements to be sampled are set according to the population proportions. This is proportional quota sampling. If the quotas are not set according to population proportions, then it is known as non-proportional quota sampling. These quotas are then divided up among the interviewers who simply set out to find enough individuals who fit the required quota criteria. Quota sampling is quite similar to stratified sampling, but unlike stratified sampling, the participants are not selected randomly from the population. Quota sampling is also different from cluster sampling because there is no random sampling within each subgroup. It is also different from systematic sampling because there is no randomness used to start the process, spacing between sample selection, and once the quota is filled, the sampling stops. Among the advantages of quota sampling is that it has intuitive appeal, especially if proportional quotas are used. It is particularly useful when you are unable to obtain a probability sample, but you are still trying to create a sample that is as representative as possible of the population being studied. In this respect, it is the non-probability based equivalent of the stratified random sample. It is also easier to administer. Quota sampling does not require a sampling frame and the strict use of random sampling techniques. This makes quota sampling popular in undergraduate and master's level dissertations where there is a need to divide the population being studied into strata or groups. It also improves the representation of particular strata or groups within the population as well as to ensure that these strata are not overrepresented. The stratification of a sample allows us to more easily compare these groups. However, the disadvantages of quota sampling is that the specific characteristics on which to base the quota has to be decided a priori. It must also be possible to clearly divide the population into strata, that is, each unit from the population must belong to one stratum. Like all non-probability sampling techniques, sampling error cannot be estimated because it is not random. It is possible that the unit selected in the sample will be based on ease of access and cost considerations, resulting in sampling bias. It also means that it is not possible to make generalizations from the sample to the population. So this can lead to problems of external validity. The particular units in the quota selected may be unreliable or inappropriate, either because they do not know the type of information to be collected or have a vested interest in not telling the truth. Many quotas need to be constructed if there are multiple criteria. For instance, if data on males and females are to be collected from urban and rural areas, four quotas are needed. This number multiplies rapidly as the number of criteria increases. Another disadvantage of quota sampling is that interviewers get to choose whoever or whatever they like. This biased approach of the researcher influences the accuracy of the result of the quota sampling research method. Expert or judgment sampling is where you draw your sample from a panel of experts in the field you're studying. It is used when you need the opinions or assessment of people with a high degree of knowledge or demonstrable experience in study area. When used in this way, expert sampling is a subtype of purposive sampling. Another reason to use experts is to validate another non-probabilistic sampling method. For instance, the researcher used quota sampling and is concerned that the criteria used for defining the quotas are subject to criticisms. So the researcher might convene an expert panel consisting of people with acknowledged experience and insight into the topic and ask them to examine his quota criteria and comment on their appropriateness and validity. Among the advantages of expert sampling is that the sampling is focused and the researchers have experts' opinions to back up their choice. 
an expert's view is typically valued more than a non-expert one, given that the expert has knowledge of an area that the layman may not have. Therefore, it can make up somewhat for the absence of knowledge of the population. When using experts, no sampling is required, and discussions with experts may open doors to new perspectives or areas of research. However, the disadvantages of expert or judgment sampling is that even the experts can be, and often are, wrong. For instance, how many economists predicted the arrival of the global crisis? And because they have views about the topic, they may be less open to other point of views. And of course, the bias of the sample is unknown, and the random error cannot be estimated because samples are not randomly selected. There's also the problem of how to identify and choose between the experts. Some populations that we are interested in can be hard to reach. These include populations such as drug addicts, homeless people, individuals with AIDS or HIV, prostitutes, and so forth. Such populations can be hard to reach or hidden because they exhibit some kind of social stigma, illicit or illegal behaviors, or other traits that make them atypical or socially marginalized. Snowball sampling is a non-probability sampling technique that can be used to gain access to such populations. Snowball sampling involves two steps. We begin by identifying someone who meets the criteria for inclusion in the study. Finding just a small number of individuals willing to identify themselves and take part in the research may be quite difficult, so the aim is to start with just one or two people. The next step is to ask these subjects to recruit others who also meet the criteria. For ethical reasons, these new research participants should come forward themselves, rather than being identified by the initial subjects. The process continues until sufficient units have been identified to meet the desired sample size. Clearly, if rapport cannot be established with these first few respondents, this method will not work. Although snowball sampling would hardly lead to representative samples, there are times when it may be the best method available. Snowball sampling is especially useful when you're trying to reach populations that are inaccessible or hard to find. For instance, if you're studying the homeless, you are not likely to be able to find a good list of homeless people within a specific geographical area. However, if you go on to areas frequented by the homeless and identify one or two of them, you may find that they know very well who the other homeless people are in their vicinity and how you can find them. The homeless represent a relatively easy target, however. Those socially stigmatized may not be that easy to find. Groups of those people tend to protect their own and are unlikely to freely disclose information to strangers. The disadvantage of snowball sampling is that the researcher has little control over the sampling method and is hostage to whoever he or she meets first and also how much the first subject knows about others. The quantity, quality and type of information collected is path dependent. And like other non-probability sampling, sampling error is unknown and the findings may not be representative of the population and therefore there would be no external validity. There are many variants of purposive sampling, although none are as popular as those previously discussed. Some examples, stakeholder sampling, where we identify major stakeholders in a research issue and then interview them. Extreme case sampling, where we find an extreme case because it represents one endpoint and another that represents the opposite. For instance, most profitable versus most loss-making companies. Typical case sampling, where we find a typical case that can give some claim to representativeness. In the above example, we would find a firm of average profitability. But what is typical is not always easy to determine either. Maximum variation sampling, where we choose subjects that have a wide range of perspectives and attributes. This includes extreme and typical cases and may be viewed as a combination of methods two and three. Criterion sampling is where we choose subjects according to a specific criterion, for instance, whether a person smokes 10 packs of cigarettes or more a day. Critical case sampling is where we look for a decisive case that can lead to subjective generalizations. For instance, study of living creatures at great ocean depths show that um, creatures can exist at much shallower depths. Disconfirming or negative sampling, where we look for a case that disproves a particular theory or point of view or argument. 
A convenient sample is simply one where the units that are selected for inclusion in sample are the easiest to access. However, convenient sampling is not only non-probabilistic, but also haphazard. Sampling is done at the researcher's convenience. The researcher simply stops anyone on the street and asks if they would like to answer his or her questions. Included in this category is the traditional man-on-the-street interviews conducted frequently by television news programs to get a quick, although non-representative, reading of public opinion. Another example is the use of students in much social research is primarily a matter of convenience. In many research contexts, we sample simply by asking for volunteers. Among the advantages of convenience sampling is that it may be the only feasible approach, given limited resources and time. It is easy to administer and relatively cheaper compared to other methods. But since this method cuts a large part of the population, as a result leads to many disadvantages. Since this method is completely dependent on where the subjects are selected, there's the possibility of under or over-representation of the population. Sampling error cannot be estimated because it is not random. Bias is also not known, and most importantly, the findings of the survey cannot be generalized to the population as a whole. Here is an example of findings from a feedback survey of visitors at the Economic Transformation Program Open Day. It was found that 84% agreed that the ETP is viable. So what do you think is wrong with the sampling method?